Patrick Bowen, Dr. Patrick Bowen, um, received his PhD from the University of Denver and uh, specializes in religious conversion and the history of non-mainline religions in the West. In addition to writing a series of books and articles on American converts to Islam and the history of Western esotericism, Dr. Bowen was the driving force behind and the co-editor of Letters to the Sage, which published hundreds of letters written to Thomas Moore Johnson. And uh, Dr. Bowen is going to uh, talk about Thomas Moore Johnson as the galvanizer of new religious movements in America. Patrick, the stage is yours. Okay. Now, in the study of both ancient philosophy and of what are often called esoteric religions, uh, the number seven has long been seen as a particularly important, if not a perfect, number. Uh, the ancient Greeks had seven planets, seven sages, seven wonders of the world. Uh, the Mesopotamians had seven heavens, a concept that later could be found in the teachings of uh, Judaism, Islam, and even Hinduism. And there are also, of course, numerous references to the number seven in the Bible, from God's day of rest, in Genesis, to the seven churches and seven seals in the book of Revelation. The 19th century esotericists, with whom Thomas Moore Johnson, TMJ, uh, affiliated, were very much aware of this pattern. Uh, so when, for instance, the Theosophical Society formed its first American governing body, Johnson was one of its seven members. And when the society's first competitor, uh, the Hermetic Brotherhood of Luxor, created its American Governing Committee, uh, Johnson was made a, one of its seven members as well. Indeed, when Johnson attempted to start his own esoteric circle, he proposed that it would have seven members. And it should also not go without comment that Johnson's most prominent journal, The Platonist, which was referred to earlier, that ran for seven years. So it is fitting and rather auspicious, I think, that today on this November 7th, I am with you here celebrating not only Thomas Moore Johnson's life and legacy, but also the completion of a journey that I began almost precisely seven years ago. <laughs> it was in the late fall of 2012 that I first learned of Johnson and became determined to track down any traces of him that I could find. With the generous and expeditious help of Mr. Tom Johnson and the Johnson Library and Museum and Ms. Ann Baker and the rest of the MSU Special Collection staff, uh, by the end of winter, I was here in Springfield, pouring over hundreds of pages of letters and unpublished documents. Although there have been a few previous scholarly summaries of Thomas Moore Johnson's uh, philosophical efforts, I had come specifically to dig into his esoteric exploits. And I had sorted through, transcribed, and uh, after all the scans were made, I began analyzing the sometimes nearly indecipherable uh, scrawl of Johnson's correspondence. And uh, one thing became clear. TMJ had a profound effect on the emergence of new religious movements in the United States. Subsequently, as the years have passed and I've been able to further study his impact and legacy, <coughs> My view on this topic has not really changed uh, other than by coming into sharper focus. What I would like to talk about today is this more refined picture of Johnson that I've been able to appreciate over the years since my original research trip to this campus. Uh, this can only be appreciated, however, if at the outset we acknowledge that Johnson was a complex man with, and any one view of him 
is only a partial view at best. Um, as several of us are aware, throughout his life, Johnson had many irons in the fire, and uh, Dr. Futsu has referred to a lot of these different things, and uh, so has uh, uh, the dean here, and uh, we have, could talk about it a little bit here. Uh, outside of his involvement with es esoteric religious groups, he was a family man, a community leader, obviously a translator, a bibliophile, a philosopher, a publisher, a newspaper man, uh, and an attorney. Uh, within esotericism, uh, he was placed in multiple national leadership positions and served as one of the primary conduits through which several occult ideas and secret documents passed. Johnson was also a visionary. As his ventures into the uncharted realms of esotericism had sprung out of a deep philosophical, philosophical conviction uh, that he hoped to make manifest throughout the world. Uh, and these last few credits alone are probably sufficient to establish Johnson and his historical place as a respectable esotericist in the American religious history. Johnson, however, was much more than that. I'd like to propose today that TMJ's role in American religious history best comes into light when we look at what he was not. Now, at least what he was not within the realms of esotericism and new religious movements. Uh, to take one example, Johnson, who seems to have, as we've mentioned, uh, maybe five times so far, he actively disliked travel and was by no means an organizer in any traditional sense when it comes to esotericism. There is no indication that Johnson put in any significant footwork, handshaking, or face-to-face -face time to help unite the members and potential members of the various organizations he was involved with outside of his hometown, Osceola. Uh, that job was usually left up to enthusiastic early members uh, who lived in bigger cities, and pretty much everybody lived in a bigger city than Osceola. <laughs> uh, and um, they were more easily able to seek outside uh, similarly minded acquaintances. Uh, Johnson, furthermore, was not, at least when it came to esoteric issues, a prominent lecturer. Uh, again, notwithstanding the fact that I actually have no idea of the quality of his public speaking skills, uh, the required travel for the job would have been sufficient in and of itself to keep him away from thriving in such an effort. Uh, Johnson was also not particularly prolific or persuasive public writer uh, when, it, when it came to esoteric topics. Uh, he certainly wrote many private letters and as a journal editor and translator, he penned several pieces over the years. But readers of his journals were not primarily reading for Johnson's own thoughts. Uh, they were interested in the wide variety of republications, translations, and commentaries uh, by the various other writers that he printed. Uh, finally, uh, last in this list of things that Johnson did not excel in, uh, he was not much of a manager in the esoteric groups. He did not oversee any local branch, and he was reluctant to attend national meetings or even provide much input when they occurred, as we know. Uh, so this is not to say that he had no involvement. The preserved letters that we have uh, through the Johnson Library clearly indicate uh, that, at least when the situation demanded it, he did provide reports and give advice. Uh, but Johnson does not seem to have been especially invested in performing these necessary bureaucratic duties. Uh, he was, after all, a very busy man, as we know, so it is understandable that he did not want to devote much time to such tedious clerical tasks. So to to summarize these four points here, uh, in the realm of esoteric movements, Johnson did not stand out as an organizer, he did not stand out as a lecturer, he did not stand out as a public writer, and he did not stand out as a manager. 
Now, the reason I bring all this up is the fact that he did not display these traits is rather, one might say, uh, delicately, historically abnormal uh, for someone with his influence, because he did have significant influence. Uh, Johnson, without a doubt, was a key figure in the rise of organized esoteric movements in the US, and it was the emergence of these movements that in turn directly led to the eruption of dozens of new non-Christian religious movements that filled the country with thousands of white Americans who became Buddhists, Hindus, Sufis, Rosicrucians, witches, and occultists of all, all sorts of types. This directly came out of efforts that he made. Now, through his impact on esotericism then, Johnson was instrumental and enormous shift in the American religious landscape. Yet my research into this broader history of America's new religious movements has usually shown me that the individuals with the most impact on the gross growth of their respective religious communities have tended to specialize in at least one of the above four traits that I just mentioned. Uh, often, in fact, they will be skilled in two or more. Uh, so, for example, uh, Helena Blavatsky, the globe-trotting original leader of the Theosophical Society, uh, she wrote large books that were read widely, very widely, in addition to having a great deal of face-to-face -face contact with early members. Alexander Russell Webb, who was at least indirectly connected with Johnson through Missouri's Theosophical Society, uh, was an eager traveler a public writer, a speaker, and a handshaker. And all these skills led him to founding the first known organized movement in America for conversion to Islam, which possibly was also the first significant movement to convert Americans to any orthodox form of an Asian majority religion. But Johnson did not do these types of things, and thus his role in American religious history was significantly different. In my opinion, more than anything else, the word that best describes his impact in this unprecedented surge of new religious movements is galvanizer. The term galvanize came into use in the mid 19th century as an eponym of Italian biologist Luigi Galvani. Uh, in the late 1700s, Galvani had famously discovered that when applied with an electric shock, I'm sure many of you know this, the muscles in a dead frog's leg would twitch. Okay, that I believe is still an experiment they sometimes do in junior high. I believe I did that. Uh, now, not only did this realization help open up the scientific study of bioelectricity, uh, popular discussions of these experiments help feed into new creative ways people outside the scientific laboratory thought about the world. Uh, so for instance, Galvani's findings most likely influenced Mary Shelley in her development of the early 19th century novel Frankenstein. And it does not seem to be a coincidence that as word about Galvani spread, we also have the appearance of what was originally referred to as animal magnetism. That is the belief soon to be associated with electricity, that there were unseen powers of magnetism that control people's physical and psychological health. Uh, practices with magnetism would soon give rise to modern hypnotism and the movement known as New Thought. Uh, magnetic practices were also strongly associated with the mid 19th century emergence of the seance room and spiritualism which themselves were soon heavily linked with notions of invisible electric forces. As Johnson's letters reveal, spiritualism and magnetic mental phenomena were topics that were especially popular among early followers of Theosophy and the Hermetic Brotherhood, uh, who saw the study of esotericism as an extension of their magnetic spiritualistic 
interests. Galvani's impact on new religious movements thus fed in multiple ways into the religious confluence that Johnson represented when he became an early leader in American theosophy and hermeticism. So just for these thematic reasons alone, the term galvanize seems appropriate. Uh, but we can go further. Uh, today, the word galvanize in its most common usage refers generally uh, to the stimulation of people into activity. And uh, we might say, for instance, that the commander galvanizes troops to go off and fight in battle. Or a news commentator galvanizes viewers to boycott a certain company. <coughs> now this, the stimulation of others into activity, is precisely the key role played by TMJ in the development of new religious movements in America. Uh, and through, and that was through his impact on esoteric movements. And at this time, I want to highlight the areas of esotericism where he accomplished this. And depending on how you count them, there are, of course, seven of those areas. <laughs> I am not going to list them by number, though, to make it nicer for you. Okay, but the first and earliest, and the one that served as a catalyst of all the others, was Johnson's work as a galvanizer uh, through his role as the editor of the Platonist, uh, which is the first of the two journals that we, uh, Dr. Puzo referred to here and show pictures of. Uh, now, as, as many of us are aware, uh, Johnson's original and primary entrance into the world of esoteric thinking was through the works of the Neoplatonists, which attracted his attention as a young college student, just like many of you, I'm sure. And uh, shortly, Johnson was devouring a wide array of ancient writings. And apparently, corresponding with a number of the Greek's American translators and expositors. Uh, one of these individuals, an eccentric, or actually extremely eccentric, but widely respected polymath, uh, named Alexander Wilder, uh, happened to have a slight taste for the mystical and had recently been recruited, <coughs> admittedly with great reluctance, into the orbit of the early Theosophical Society. Now, although it was not the first American organization formed around the examination of the esoteric, or in other words, the supposed subtle, hidden, and perennial dimensions of religion and philosophy, Although the Theosophical Society was not the first organization designed to examine and even practice such elements of religion, it seems to have been, when it formed in 1875, the first to gain significant media attention. To further their cause, early on the group had conceived of publishing a magazine that would be, according to Wilder, in an 1876 letter to Johnson, uh, this magazine would be both theosophical, that is, esoteric, and, quote, Platonian. Uh, the desire to link esotericism and Platonism for this proposed journal was born out of the fact that esotericism had been strongly connected with Platonism throughout history. Um, and although Wilder, who was enthusiastic about spreading Platonism to the public, Although he had agreed to edit the journal, uh, he was not upset when in 1877, the next year, the group's heads abandoned the scheme after failing to find funding for it. Uh, so the reason for his lack of disappointment with that was that the Theosophical leaders had intended to appeal to emotions rather than the intellect only. And such methods did not sit right with Wilder, who was himself more than anything else an intellectual. Uh, it was with joy then that Wilder received the news in early 1879 that Johnson had decided to start a truly intellect-focused Platonic journal. 
Uh, the self-made wilder brimmed with pride at Johnson, <coughs> taking the bull by the horns himself, calling the ambition, quote, glorious. Words of encouragement, introductions to potential readers and publishers, and numerous journal submissions would pour from Wilder's pen over the next several years, as Johnson planned and then began producing the Platonist. Indeed, it was Wilder, Johnson's elder by 28 years, whom Johnson first galvanized. Had it not been so, Johnson's journal may not have carried the weight of respect and dignity that it did. And it certainly would not have had as far a reach. Having been armed by Wilder with the knowledge of the theosophical interest in Platonism, in 1881, Johnson sent the second issue of his journal to the group's new headquarters in India, where it piqued the interest of, that is, galvanized, the group's leaders. Uh, by that time, the Theosophists had started in India a Theosophy-focused journal, and in reply to Johnson's, in reply to Johnson's mail, they suggested that the two journals run advertisements, and they, this would also include endorsements of each other in each other's journals. So, Johnson agreed to this, and he was soon corresponding directly with the India-based heads of the Theosophical Society, as well as with a number of prominent American and British Theosophists, several of whom were eager to engage with the editor of the Platonists, which they had nearly all read after the Theosophical endorsement. This was a crucial event in the development of American Theosophy, uh, for the society had fallen inactive in the United States by the late 1870s. The, pre the preserved letters to Johnson suggest that both his journal and theosophical affiliation were helping to reawaken the desire to establish, reestablish theosophy in America. Indeed, it was at this time that the first new American Lodge, which was finally really only the second lodge ever set up in America, was established. But Theosophy's American success was still not certain. After all, the new lodge was in Rochester, whereas the first had been in New York City. Uh, the society still had not formally made it outside of the borders of the state of New York. So it was, again, largely thanks to Johnson that the next American lodge, which was the first to be established outside the state of New York, was able to be created. In all the preserved letters from esotericists to Johnson, uh, there is perhaps no one that better encapsulates the galvanizing role played by Johnson in the establishment of new religious movements than an August 3, 1882 missive written by Elliot B. Page. Uh, for context, it's important to know that when Page first discovered the Platonist journal by chance in St. Louis the previous April, he felt compelled, in other words, he was galvanized uh, to write to Johnson that very day and to express his enthusiasm and support. So now, four months later, after having recently been advised by the Theosophical Heads to start a new lodge in St. Louis, and advised by them that Johnson would help him with this effort, he was convinced, and this is Page, Page was convinced that his recent encounters with Johnson and the esotericists in India uh, were signs that, quote, the occultists of both hemispheres, notably of the East, are preparing for some grand movement which cannot fail to leave its mark upon the whole race and that he, Page, had been chosen to play a key role in this important moment in history. Now, Page had read Blavatsky well before learning of Johnson, but it was only after discovering the Platonist and seeing that a true, quote, knowing one, as he called Johnson, was living nearby. Uh, it was only after that that he would be motivated to take his next important step. Uh, within months, 
Page was starting the first American Theosophical Lodge outside the state of New York. And Johnson was named as one of the charter members. It was this event, uh, this display of the society planting its firm roots in the middle west of the United States uh, that seems to have unlocked the door for American Theosophy. Soon, new branches, often led by Johnson's correspondence, were popping up across the country. And by late 1880s, thanks largely to theosophy, organized esotericism based around explicitly non-Christian themes that become a very public part of American life. So, out of respect, Johnson was duly made a uh, member of Theosophy's first American governing board. And to put a fine point on my thesis, uh, all of this happened without Johnson having made any speeches, without having appeared in the flesh to solidify the creation of any of the new lodges, without having managed the affairs of any group, and without having written popular-themed, emotionally-tinged essays. Uh, furthermore, while this was happening, Johnson continued to inspire the pursuit of additional aspects of esotericism, emboldened by their affiliations with Johnson and the blossoming philosophical <coughs> society. Early theosophists and their friends were increasingly taking an interest in lesser known topics, such as, as have been referred to, tarot cards and Rosicrucians and all sorts of fun little interesting things that we still kind of get into today when we're on Wikipedia and YouTube sometimes. I don't know about you guys, but I do. Um, and as several of the preserved letters reveal, uh, frequently such interests were cultivated with Johnson explicitly advising his correspondence on their study. Uh, by 1885, when barely 34 years of age, Johnson was also galvanizing on a new path that of Theosophy's first real organized competitor, the Hermetic Brotherhood of Luxor. Uh, recognizing Johnson's significant influence within the American esoteric community, the British heads of the Brotherhood entrusted him to be one of the primary points of contact for its American neophytes. Again, Johnson's prestige, intelligence, and enthusiasm all helped ensure this new group's growth, despite him not playing a particularly active role uh, outside of being a willing correspondent. Uh, he was soon named president of the American branch of that order. It may be noteworthy that in this last capacity, on at least a small number of occasions, uh, Johnson did play a more involved role than he had previously. Uh, in the summer of 1886, he presided over two meetings, one held 100 miles away in Kansas City, and another held over 200 miles away in St. Louis. Uh, the issue of concern at these meetings was whether the British heads should be followed. And uh, had their leadership been rejected, Johnson, as the American president, would have possibly been in a position to become the full head of the Order of the Hermetic Brotherhood. Uh, his attendance, therefore, may have been prompted by that very possibility, although it turned out that at least one of the British heads was re-accepted uh, after a two-month waiting period. Uh, interestingly, in the spring of the following year, uh, Johnson sent out what he called an ordinance uh, to six other leading American Hermetic Brotherhood members in an attempt to organize what was termed a new section of the group. Now, at this act, one of Johnson's only known attempts to, at organizing in esotericism, this actually sparked some contestation over Johnson's leadership. So soon after, uh, the American Hermetic Brotherhood's activities appear to have decreased significantly, and uh, Johnson let go of the reins of the movement. Uh, in, the, uh -oh. in the ensuing decades of Johnson's life, there were a handful of vestigial examples of his galvanizing impact. 
there were a few attempts to revamp the Hermetic Brotherhood, and at two points there were claims made that the Order of Sufis, which was the reformulation of the group Johnson had previously uh, proposed to be his section of the Hermetic Brotherhood. Uh, let's see. That was active and that Johnson was a member. So the, there was a claim that the Order of Sufis was still alive, uh, but that is somewhat contested. Um, in any case, uh, there is also the case of Alexander Russell Webb, uh, the first white American to lead a nationally recognized movement for conversion to an orthodox form of a non-Christian religion, as I've mentioned. When, in 1893, Webb, a former member of the St. Louis, Louis Theosophical Lodge, uh, who had at least one friendship in common with Johnson, uh, he, when he announced and described his conversion to Islam, uh, he claimed that his conversion had been precipitated by access to a large library of esoteric, philosophical, and religious literature. And so that is very suggestive of TMJ's, uh, that is very suggestive of TMJ's own uh, library. <coughs> Uh, Webb's Islamic movement, moreover, was highly influenced by theosophy, and one wonders whether he was galvanized by Johnson's own interest in Islamic mysticism. All right, now with all this being said, one can appreciate something else about Johnson by taking a step back and examining his impact. The core years of Johnson's direct involvement with esotericism were roughly 1881 to 1886, the seven years uh, that correspond to the publication of the Platonists. It was truly a relatively short period of time in which Johnson, not even 40 years old, played a key role in the expansion of organized non-Christian religious activities in America. Prior to Johnson's involvement, Although there have been several small and short-lived attempts to institute such groups, nothing like a real movement had appeared. When similar predecessors and even religious giants, such as Madame Blavatsky herself, attempted to start cultural revolutions, they frequently failed. The Muslim Alexander Webb, to take another example, had been preceded two decades earlier by a convert to Islam who attempted to find sympathizers among spiritualists, but also no avail for him as well. There was therefore something unique about Thomas More Johnson. One would have to do a great deal of reaching to say that Johnson, being from Osceola, and with all due respect to those from Osceola, one would have to really stretch credibility to say that Johnson was in the right place at the right time. <laughs> uh, indeed, it's hard to imagine a place in America less right for being the electrifying source of a major wave of new religions, of liberal religions, of non-Christian religions. It's hard to imagine a place being less central to that. Yet, uh, for a short period, seven years to be precise, young, in my opinion young, uh, <laughs> Thomas Moore Johnson from Osceola, Missouri, sent a powerful charge throughout the country and really throughout the world, which both shocked and transformed modern religious culture. It is really something to consider on this day, November 7th, birthday of Plato. I'd like to thank MSU and the Johnson Library for bringing me out here and all my other speakers. Thank you very much for bringing me out here today. Alright, so I'm going to invite if there's any question for, uh, for Dr. Bowen. This is a good time as to ask them and uh, if you don't have questions now, but you're kind of pondering and you want to keep those questions for later, there will be time too. But if there's any 
uh, kind of pressing curiosity, this is a good time to kind of raise your hand and ask. Yes, John. I'm kind of curious about this circle's interest in Sufism. Uh, like Thomas More Johnson and Webb and others, how, how big was that? And okay, well, you know, so Islam is what brought me out here. Uh, I primarily study conversion to Islam, as was mentioned earlier, but uh, we don't really know why uh, Webb, who was a member of the Theosophical Society, got interested in it. But we did find out that there were there was an advertisement run in the Theosophical Journal in the fall of 1886 uh, from a Muslim in India, and he was discussing uh, mysticism. Now. We also have some evidence that Alexander Wilder, who was Thomas Johnson's correspondent, and we'll be discussed a little bit more, uh, he had become familiar with uh, Sufi writings and translations. So because he was so influential for Johnson, because there, were, uh, there was this um, presence of Islamic mysticism in the Theosophical Society, and because uh, Hermetic Brotherhood actually had based its original doctrines around uh, what was purported to be a Islamic occult movement, even though it really wasn't, but it was purported <laughs> to be. Uh, there were a lot of um, ideas feeding into this, and we believe that that's what he was latching onto, and since no one had organized around that before, that's where that stems from, but we don't know entirely. In fact, uh, I found the letter about his organizing the secret circle, um, not in our, in the Johnson Library letters, but in a different letter collection. Um, so, you know, there's not a lot of evidence regarding that, but in general, those are the three uh, feeding elements. 